right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Danielle Mulvey, who is actually just up the road in an equally sunny Orange County. How are you doing, Danielle? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and, and Danielle is from a company called Five Star Employees. And for the last 10 years, they developed and tested and shared with others exactly how to recruit, hire and retain five star employees. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So how to stop the insanity of settling for less than five star employees. It's a great subject, Danielle. And I'll have to honestly admit is like over the years and all the companies I've worked for and companies I've run or whatever, I mean, I would put my, I would put my hiring, my hiring success against anyone's. And by that, I mean, it's a hit or a miss and I've had some good ones, but probably a lot of bad ones too. So why, why is hi, why is hiring still such a, such an incredibly difficult thing? And why is it that it's, it's almost like a six month, I always feel like it's a six month gamble, right? After six months, you know whether you've made the right choice or not. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think I, I wouldn't give someone six months, but um, okay. <laughs> but you, yeah. So what's interesting is is it, it, hiring becomes out of like desperation, and um, it's not something that people typically plan for. And so, um, but it's important that if you want to hire five star employees, that you dedicate some time to going all in on your recruitment and hiring process so that you, number one, are attracting five-star candidates, but more importantly, repelling one, two, and three-star candidates who you don't want to be tempted by. So I think the problem is, is that, you know, a hiring manager has a good heart and a hiring manager has a hole to fill and, um, and you want to believe people, right? <laughs> and so when someone says they can do something or, you know, they, they, they seem eager, they seem enthusiastic, you know, all of these things, a hiring manager with a, with a good warm heart who likes to see the good in people will say, okay, well, yeah, let's make this work. But what that hiring manager has failed to do is failed to actually, um, make sure that that person isn't just saying it, but they can actually do it. Because like I tell my kids all the time, what matters saying it or doing it. And in a job, <laughs> what matters is not saying it, but actually doing it. So there's, you know, so many different things that are important in the recruitment and the hiring process that will uh, allow you to really, again, attract those five-star candidates and repel um, those one, two, and three-star candidates. Because here's the thing, you know, right now, most people, like you said, it's about a hit or miss. Most, mm -hmm. most people are successful 25% of the time in hiring a five-star mm -hmm. employee. So one out of four hires ends up being a great rock star employee. But sadly, you're mishiring on the other three out of four candidates. When you're using an objective system like the five-star employee rating system, to, you know, really objectively assess the candidate, you can get to a 90% success rate in hiring a five-star candidate. But what is a five-star candidate? Um, I guess we should define that to begin with. So <laughs> yeah. we, we define a five-star employee as the top 15% of available talent in the market. So, mm. um, and, and you don't pay, you know, it's not like you're going to pay someone you know, oh, you're a five-star person. I'm going to pay you twenty thousand dollars more than this this other guy that is probably a three-star employee. Right. I, you you can't pay for performance. So so it's it's at the rate that you're willing to pay. Um, the top fifteen percent of candidates end up being that five-star candidate, and so that's a numbers game. It's one out of seven mm -hmm. candidates is a potential five-star uh -huh. employee. So you know, I mean, you need to have twenty-one applicants to have three potential five-star candidates in the pool. Right. If that makes sense. Right. So it's, and it, most people settle for no, like the, the first three interviews. Yeah, no that that makes that makes total sense. And 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 I was just like uh, as you were talking, just thinking about as I said about all the different experiences I've had over the years. And I think part of the problem is, as you've just outlined here, is that everybody kind of has a, just an old 
traditional process that they use. Nobody wants to really invest time or energy in it. Recruiting is, as you said, I mean, it's often something, a need comes up, you want to get it filled, you want it to happen, you want HR just to go find, and and the first person who looks good on paper, you're like, cool, let's go. So I think a lot of it has to come back to whether you're willing to invest the time and energy in, in the process, right? Yeah, exactly, for sure. Um, and you know, it's like, that's why, so our, our company is actually called the all in company. And what we do is we work with business owners on going all in on their recruitment and hiring, because when you go all in on your employees, they'll, they'll respond by going all in on you. And, and that's kind of like the magic of people wanting to build a dream team of people who think and act like owners. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like, well, let's get a return on that investment. If you, if you just half-ass your, your recruitment and hiring, you're going to get half-ass candidates. But if you go (laughs) all in on your recruitment and hiring and really building that culture that retains five-star employees, because you don't settle for less than, less than five-star employees, then, um, you know, that's just really where the, where the magic happens. Yeah. So here's a here's a challenge I see is so if you're if you have a company today and perhaps you have done your traditional hiring, you have a couple of rock stars, you have a lot of you know people in the middle, and you have some people who you're still trying to figure out why they're still here. Um and you want to attract more of the rock stars. You want to attract the five stars. So how do you start that process? Because, I mean, it's it's there's a duality to it, isn't there? I mean, if you're trying to hire and find the best people, you also have to kind of start to clear shop, if you like, a little bit and, and make room for and, and uh, top grade, I think, uh, yeah. is is the phrase for it. Um, so. Th- that that's something that you need it you need a process you need to plan that that's not something that's going to happen overnight because um, so how do you attract those kind of people when you're in a transition yeah so so when you're in that kind of transition i think it's important so one of the fi- one of the stars in our five star rating system is return on payroll so you know mm-hmm. every employee should be producing at least a 3x return on their payroll like what they're doing, their, their, their presence in the company, their contributions in the company are producing three X of what you're paying them. So if you're paying someone $50,000, they should have $150,000 impact on the company. Um, and you know, what's interesting, especially about comparing five-star employees versus one, two or three-star employees is one five-star employee does the work of two or three two or three star employees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by, by shedding those one, two and three star employees. Now you're really not missing much. You really need to shed, shed two of them (laughs) at a time (laughs) to maybe get any sort of impact. Um, so, uh, so, so, so that's kind of like the first, the first mindset about things is, is sort of like, okay, I'm going to hire this person. What do their key responsibilities need to be so that they have an impact of bringing a 3x, at least a 3x return on their payroll? All right. And so from there, with that mindset of like, okay, we're going to hire people that are going to help us produce a return, help us grow the business. Um, Now, okay, well, what can they be doing? What should their three to five key responsibilities be? in order for this to happen, for them to be three Xing their payroll. Um, and so when you, when you hone in on what those three to five key responsibilities are, then the next step is you need to define what success looks like for those key responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, if you need someone to, um, to close, um, close new business, I mean, most job descriptions are going to be, hey, we need a rock star who can close new business. And, and mm-hmm. that's it. It's not quantified. Yeah. It, there's no, there's mm-hmm. no numbers. There's no dollar signs associated with it. So when you, when you quantify what success means for those key responsibilities, it should say, you know, we're looking for someone who can close five new accounts per month and, um, and, and, and upsell three um, mm-hmm. type of thing. Uh, so that, uh, it's very, very specific. And then, you know, you, you talk about that, that's part of your culture is about hitting those numbers and talking about those numbers every day and making sure that that pipeline is, is, is humming and working and, and you have to hold people accountable and five-star employees, five-star candidates. They're like, yes, bring it on. I got this. I want this. I can do it. 
but that's only the top 15% of available talent in the market. Right. Most people yeah. are either going to be like, oh, this seems like really serious. This seems like one of those <laughs> jobs where I probably won't be able to collect a pay, just collect a paycheck and right. they'll probably want to know where I am at all times and stuff. So I'm not going to apply to this one. So, you know, yeah. that's the, that's the beauty of this. It, it works both ways. You, you attract the five-star candidates who are, who are driven mm -hmm. um, and who love to know where the bar is set and they, they want to hit it or exceed it. And then it repels those people that you, that you don't want, that you shouldn't settle for. And right. um, you don't want to be tempted by. Yeah. And and the, the interesting thing you just touched on there, though, is and I think this is another failing and we're probably all very guilty of this is is the is the uh, definition of the role. There's so many ill defined roles out there or you take. Oh, let's see. We need to fill this role here. Grab a grab a, a job description off the internet, and we'll just massage it a little bit. But I do feel that most there's not a lot of thought that goes into it, um, and uh, and you know there's a lot of rote and you know or, or repetitive stuff just thrown in that's on everyone. Um, so I guess that's a as you just outlined. There's a great starting point for people is to look at what are, what are you actually advertising. Um, I, I had an experience years ago when. Um, a recruiter uh, came to me and said, oh, you know, there's a back in the dot com days when I was up in Silicon Valley. And, and she said, oh, there's this dot com and they've got this great new role on the executive team, blah, blah, blah. And to cut a long story short, I went out and interviewed with the whole executive team and all of that individually. And then I came back and told the CEO of the company, I said, this is just a job that's made up of all the bits that other people don't want to do. And it's not going to be successful. And um, I said, so uh, that, that's my feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happens. It, it just sort of is it, it, it there's no intention typically. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I'm happy like, recruiter too by the way, but yeah. Oh, honest. I'm sure. <laughs> um and and you know, I find I find titles are misleading too as mm -hmm. well. It's like people kind of just make these, you know, glom on to these generic titles about a position or they make the the title sound more glamorous than the position really is. And so, you know, that's another thing that's important, it, especially in standing out. Because again, like you said, I, I mean, if, if you went and looked at applying, let's just say for a bookkeeper um, position, I mean, all the positions, 99.9% .9 of them would all sound the same. They all have kind of mm -hmm. the same function and, and work and such. But if you can get really clear on what you're looking for and use that in the title description, um, you know, that becomes a game changer. And again, that is going to be attracting the, the five-star candidates. So if you say, um, you know, a small business bookkeeper with the heart of a teacher, like that's mm. going to stand out in a crowded field of, you know, part-time bookkeeper, full-time bookkeeper, <laughs> da, da, da. because we, because we said, you know, who, who we serve and, and, and kind of like the, the special quality that we're looking for in a bookkeeper, not just someone who's good at compliance and putting things in the right boxes. Yeah, no, that's a, that is that is a great point because again, as you said, I mean, we tend to be very generic in our titles or we get, we get silly creative you know and we just make uh, up these ones that don't yeah. resonate with anybody and, and look a bit silly um so then uh so then when you come to okay so if you're attracting the right candidates the next part of a process that normally falls down is is the actual you know the interviewing the assessment right. all of mm -hmm. that stuff i mean that that is in most companies, again, that's that's kind of follows an age-old process or a very traditional process. You get a bunch of people do some interviews, and then you go, yeah, yay or nay. Uh, in your experience, like how do you how do you interview, or what is the next part of the process once you get applicate applicants in order to make sure you're getting the right candidates? Yeah. So so the so in our process, um, we do an automated assessment, and that assessment we use Preview. Um, it scores the candidate against the position benchmark. So we have different benchmarks for different positions across our different companies and such. And so if someone scores 70% or higher against the benchmark for the position they're applying for, they move to our next phase, which is, mm -hmm. um, which is a screening interview. And in the screening interview, we um, are just kind of getting to know the candidate casually, um, kind of just kicking the tires a bit. But there we start... Um, trying to um, evaluate them 
on the 11 qualities of a five-star employee. So we've identified 11 universal qualities that make for a five-star employee. And some of them, um, you know, are, are things that if the person doesn't have it, it's easy to change. So, um, if the person uh, doesn't have, you know, doesn't demonstrate like an insatiable thirst for knowledge because they're not like consuming podcasts, they're not reading business books, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that's relatively easy to change. And, and oftentimes people just don't know what they don't know. And so, you know, like this is kind of, I like these kind of candidates because it's like, you know, they, 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 they're, they, they can be a great sponge. And so that's an opportunity where, okay, in the interview, they scored a two in terms of thirst for insatiable thirst for knowledge. Um, but you know, when we talked about different things, they seemed really interested in such. And so, you know, if I, if I, if I nurture them a little bit, if I decide to hire them, I think I can get them up to a four or a five in terms of that, that quality. But then there's two qualities that, um, out of the 11 that we have coded red <laughs> and these ones mm -hmm. are very difficult or impossible to change. And one of them is flexibility. And the second one is active listening. And I had, um, I, I had, I, an interview with a candidate back in March and it was a screening interview and we were about three minutes into the interview and she wasn't answering the questions that I was asking. So I'm like, she listening to me. Uh, so I kind of slowed down a little bit, kind of got a little bit more basic in the questions and gave her a couple more minutes. And at the five and a half minute mark, she just was talking, but not answering the questions. And so right. at that point I said, you know what, I'm sorry. Um, I just don't think this is going to be a good fit for us and wish you the best and have a great day. Goodbye. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to waste my time. You know, I think a lot of people kind of think, oh, well, this is awkward. It's like, no, it's not awkward. You just need to like, let it go. Because what's worse is wasting that candidate's time when at the five minute mark, you know that you are not interested in that candidate. Don't string them along for another 20 minutes mm -hmm. or 30 minutes thinking you're polite. You're that's, <laughs> that's just, that's just unfair to the candidate. So, um, yeah. so, so in this case, like, I mean, red flag, she was not an active listener and that wasn't going to work. So, uh, so we, we, um, moved on to the other candidates in our pipeline. Yeah. And she went on to be a politician. So there you go. Everything worked out. <laughs> she she <laughs> did. Good. She, she, her current job was in government. So. Oh, really? There you go. Yeah. Well, a perfect place to, to not answer questions. Yeah. You um, set that up. Yeah, so. Yeah, so the um, so interesting, interesting on on active listening because here's something, Daniel, that I I think is fascinating today is that active listening is almost counterculture, right? It's not a skill that people have naturally these days because they're so bombarded, they're so distracted, and everything that actually focusing on what somebody is saying and listening and understanding is is to be honest, it's it's a it's becoming a rare skill, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But again, this is what makes or breaks a five-star employee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, a, there's enough out there that do yeah. have and that the, skill still. <laughs> yeah. And then you mentioned, you mentioned flexibility. So how do you, how do you uncover flexibility um, during your yeah. process? So, so, so we have these qualities and we have like standard definitions to the qualities, but you know, again, with everything, you have to get specific. You have to define what it means to you. Um, and so what's interesting about flexibility, and I think this is kind of um, sort of a double-edged sword because a lot of positions out there are advertising flexibility. Oh, this is a flexible job, flexible hours, flexible, 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 but it kind of stops there and it's left to the interpretation of the employee. And typically the employer and the employee are on two different pages in terms mm -hmm. of what flexibility means. So let me give you an example. Um, I, I, I got an email from someone uh, a couple weeks ago and, um, it was recounting an individual who had, um, was a new hire, had been with them for about um, six weeks and was kind of wrapping up the training aspect of their job. And uh, they, the, the employer said, okay, great. Um, why don't we um, look at setting up a time? What times would be good for you so that we could set a, a weekly check-in um, with your supervisor and such just to kind of like, you know, 
see how things are going mm -hmm. and, and with the work and the client load, et cetera, that you're going to be doing. And she was just like, um, what do you mean? I thought this was a flexible job. Like this is not flexible <laughs> at all. If I'm required to meet at a certain time and a certain day of the week, I quit. Wow. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 it it's like, obviously this employee had a completely different expectation of flexibility versus the employer. So the employer was very flexible. However, you know, I mean, I, I, I think it's reasonable to expect that even though you're sure. flexible, this person was an employee, they weren't a 1099 person that, that there would be check-ins, that there would be times that, that they have to come together and such. And so that's why it's so important in terms of like, what's important to you that you define it, that you get real mm -hmm. clear and real specific. So people understand the expectations because, you know, one of the, th one of the, one of the problems right now in the marketplace in terms of uh, recruiting and hiring and, you know, all these sensational headlines out there is um, a lot of people are feeling um, like they took the job and it was a bait and switch. So the mm. job description said this, oh, they talked about how great their culture was, et cetera. But when they came in, it wasn't, the reality was not what was touted during the recruitment process. And so that's why, you know, in your going all in on recruitment and hiring, you're getting really specific about what you need, what are the qualities and what you don't want in candidates. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, um, if, 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 if you like people to be, you know, up and at them in the morning and have a lot of energy, like that's important that you're kind of uncovering yeah. that and seeing if the candidate has that, um, in, in the process. So of, of recruiting and hiring. Yeah, no, no, those and and excellent points, excellent points, all of those. Uh, and and I think you're right. I think the other thing that's happened a lot is, unfortunately, a lot of companies and marketing departments love to put bumper stickers all over their websites, like we're this and we're that and we're whatever. But it's all it is at the end of the day is a is a bumper sticker, and it's not really reflected. Um, so I think those are really really good points in that you should. You know, you should be delivering whatever it is you you advertise, whether that is to your customers or to your potential employees. Yeah. It, what, what is it? What, what does it matter if you say it or if you do it? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Do perfect. It. Doesn't matter what you say. Exactly. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect way to to end. Um, all of Danielle's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Oh, my goodness. Um, so I um, have been an entrepreneur since the ripe old age of 25. So I'm going on a, about 25 years of being an entrepreneur. And um, my husband and I own several businesses that do over $50 million a year in revenue. And I only spend about 10 hours a week overseeing those operations because I have teams of five-star employees doing the work in those organizations. Um, and that gives me the free time. Um, I'm collaborating on a book with Mike Michalowicz, the author of Profit First. His next, next book is going to be called All In. Um, and we're going to focus on how um, to recruit, hire, and retain five-star employees in that book. And um, we have some programming now where we're previewing content for that book. And so people kind of going through our programming um, could be case studies um, in the book. And you can get information at fivestaremployees.com. Fantastic. Um, I love it. And I, there's a great motivation for everyone out there. Danielle is only working 15 hours a week uh, because she's hired the right people. So if you want to have more flexibility for yourself, perhaps a, the secret lies in hiring those five-star employees. So I would encourage you to go check out fivestaremployees.com. As I said, all the information will be below here. Um, thanks again, Danielle, for today. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon.